welcome to ccna cisco certified network associate and uh, let me first introduce you to what all options we have here and uh, how how do you go about the training okay so what we have done is to make the things easier for you a lot of things that you have to note down you know in any training you you basically make notes and write a lot of stuff so you can say about 90 95% of that stuff what we have done is we have kept it in the form of notes handout which you will be already having in the portal okay if you uh, scroll a little you know, on the same website where you're logging in from so there you will find the notes handout uh, and that notes handout basically includes all the uh, things that we are going to use throughout this training because a lot of times i have to show you uh, certain images to explain something certain um, you know sometimes uh, images of routers and a uh, lot of other things which may be a little complicated to understand and you might want to note it down so uh, we have included this thing okay it's a very healthy around 700 plus slides so this is the uh, detailed all the things that we think are necessary for you to write down that are already there okay so i'll not be reading the slides i'll be explaining the concepts and then maybe if uh, if i uh, feel like sometimes you know something is a little bit more complicated i'll point it out that okay you know we saw this we saw this and this is what is written here so uh, because a lot of uh, times uh, some things in any training you have to memorize so in order to memorize all the stuff uh, like the official definition of something or like you know like let's say ip address is a 32 bit address and all this facts related information you will already find them in the notes handout okay so you can uh, this session is being recorded so i tell people attend the session as if there is no recording okay i've seen people getting lazy <laughs> so uh, whenever there's recording uh, people feel lazy to ask doubts people like because sometimes you get distracted right so while attending maybe you you get distracted a little you don't hear some part and then you are not understanding something but you don't ask doubt you think okay i'll watch the video later and then if i have doubt i'll come back so uh, i would recommend don't do that because uh, that makes the training less effective so attend this training as if there is no recording there is recording the recording is being done but uh, attend as if there is no recording because you know once you attend live anything you're you're more focused and uh, also at the same time see you will be taking we'll be taking this session for three hours okay so if you have to watch like you know le let's say like 150 minutes of video you will have to take i'm saying like minimum 200 minutes because this is not like a netflix movie okay so you can't binge watch it so if you go back and watch the recording it's going to take almost i tell people sometimes double the time to uh, have this recording get completed okay so preferably you you can watch the recording but see you have to take three hours for attending this live then you have to take out two to three hours minimum if if you attend the same recording and rewatch it so sometimes you don't get that much time preferably attend and understand as much things as possible in the live session so this is one thing that you are getting notes handout so the benefit of it i already explained to you so i don't want you to make any notes i don't want you to have any notebook and focus because see human beings have one language processor so if you are writing then you are not listening okay and if you are reading then again you are uh, you know you you can't write or listen and do all these things at the same time okay or even speaking which you will be doing less of but uh, the point is don't focus on writing okay just focus on listening listening and listening and uh, sometimes some places i'll be reading along uh, with you some definitions just to clarify a little bit if in case you have doubts so don't get distracted on writing stuff down most of the uh, required stuff for writing has already been put in this notes handout okay so just leave everything focus and have only one screen i've seen people 
these days having a laptop then also a mobile maybe an ipad or anything so focus uh, on just one screen uh, this and attend it with full concentration uh, the second thing that we are uh, giving you here is a lab workbook okay now this lab workbook is uh, for labs okay because we do hands on with lot of different devices uh, to perform certain things to validate certain facts that we will learn so lab workbook is not focused on theory okay here you will find some theory uh, definitions and all in the notes and out but in lab workbook there will be no theory there will be just commands output commands output and that part okay so this thing you can use while you are doing labs yourself okay so you can follow along you can build that topology that is being shown there may be a couple of routers switches or whatever and then uh, you can perform the same tasks on the uh, lab side that is the aim of giving you the lab workbook okay if in case you have any doubt in lab workbook or notes and out feel free to ask me that so these are the two things along with that we are giving you a command guide because lot of uh, commands you will be learning here so the command guide is having um like this this kind of setup where there is a command and then there is an explanation like when do you use it okay so uh, this is to consolidate all the uh, information all the commands that you will be needing to use throughout ccna so we have tried to minimize all the distraction because these are the things that take time for you while attending training uh, you know to note these things down then you know you can't note down all the output okay so we have already given you this along with that there is also another thing called a subnetting workbook we will be going through a very detailed explanation of ip addressing subnetting so subnetting workbook will be helpful for you to practice certain questions because subnetting is a very essential part of ccna as well as networking like if you don't understand subnetting uh, you don't actually understand where a network begins where a network ends so you know this is something that you have to really understand in depth okay so th there are a couple of other things but i'll not now go into each and everything it will be too boring at <laughs> the beginning uh, we will i i will point it out like wherever you know something is required that you can read this from there and that okay now uh, uh, what do i expect oh, okay i expect that you will be spending at least you know, if we are spending our life then i expect that you should spend 2 to 3 hours of uh, self study if you want to really make the most out of this training so to spend 2 to 3 hours of uh, time doing self study Uh, like here when i'll be showing you practicals here when i'll be explaining to you uh, concepts you will not be doing much on your own okay so uh, i want you to go back and uh, spend at least 2 to 3 hours you know maybe going through the video again if it is not something to do hands on on that day but later on we'll be having routers we'll be having such as you will be needing to configure certain things on the router configure certain things on the switch and all so uh, you have to perform those things yourself and if in case you get stuck somewhere uh, you can come back to me okay now other thing that i expect from you is that you will go through this because see repetition is required here all the learning that i have had my uh, in my experience especially here into networking is you will not get sometimes the concept first time completely okay like you you get it but it's kind of like uh, you know i tell people this is like a very suspense thriller tv series <laughs> that we are having here so you know in a suspense thriller series sometimes when you watch episode 1 uh, you don't understand it completely but then when you come back to that after watching maybe episode 4 you get okay yeah this is why they showed you here okay this thing so uh, it's kind of like that interconnected very complicated story okay so 
you will have to come back and do a repetition of things if you want to have a solid understanding like conceptually okay i'll give you an example we will be uh, soon going through here after the basics of networking uh, we will be going through uh, this osi tcp ip model which you uh, might have heard of this is where most of the networking fundamentals uh, training begins from now uh, this part we will be spending a significant number of hours uh, roughly you can say around 10 to 12 hours explaining all the things of osi tcp ip model and all but i tell people after like half of ccna if you come back to this topic you will get real different insights which you will not get the first time okay because after half of ccna uh, you know you have really implemented some things okay here we will be talking like router does this but like uh, around half of the ccna completion you have really worked on the router you have really seen router doing those things so when you when you come back and you know go through those concepts again uh, you get i'm saying the same things which i'm saying today but you will be getting uh, different kind of light bulb moments in your head uh, understanding like okay i didn't think of it in that way <laughs> so uh, that that that's why i tell people that you uh, should definitely come back and uh, repeat okay so and now uh, regarding the cisco certification track if you just google search cisco certifications you will be landing at this page and here uh, you have uh, if you scroll down they show you that there is entry associate professional and expert uh, there are these uh, four levels that they say most people start from associate level because there are limited entry level uh, certifications entry level certifications are more involved into technicians kind of role where people are just starting and there are very limited options in that okay like uh, this is very recent that they uh, have brought the ccst networking and Uh, all the things that you learn in ccst networking we have already uh, covered in is uh, this uh, curriculum okay of ccna so this part we will be already covering in the ccna okay the ccna that you are doing is uh, this particular ccna earlier cisco used to have a ccna collaboration a ccna security a ccna service provider and you know lots more but now they have curtailed it down and uh, try to consolidate and make it more effective training uh, so this is the ccna that we are going to do yeah. and um, from exam perspective do i need to pass to pass the associate so i can go to professional or i can go and book straight the professional no, the, exam there is no prerequisite earlier cisco used to have prerequisite like uh, if you had to go for ccnp uh, certification exam then uh, there was a requirement that you should have a ccna then only you could go for ccnp but they removed it uh, so now it is not so okay so like if you see ccnp okay so mm -hmm. there is no formal prerequisite for ccnp enterprise commonly they recommend that you should have 3 to 5 years of experience implementing some solutions but there is no uh, as in paper certification required for you to jump on to this okay same is the case with other certifications okay so earlier they used to have and that that was problematic because think about it this way okay suppose you are a 10 years experienced person uh, you have done your job now you don't want to start with ccna just because you want to go for ccnp right so that is why a lot of people used to say like why why are you making me do ccna i'm a experienced guy so they removed all those uh, you know prerequisites of certifications okay and that that's also good business for them because people who didn't uh, maybe plan to go for a ccna now maybe they'll be doing for ccnp okay so uh, let's start with this ccna okay if you click on this and i'll open it in another tab <clears throat> here uh, in the ccna if i scroll these are the kind of uh, common core 
uh, sections that we will be going through. We'll be going through network fundamentals, network access, IP connectivity, IP services, security fundamentals, and some part of automation and programmability. Now, uh, here the, they say these are the possible job roles. There is obviously no formal prerequisites, but like one or more years of experience uh, of Cisco, which even uh, sometimes there is zero years of experience for CCNA. Now, uh, if you scroll down, here they show you this uh, exam, which if you want to go for the certification exam, they tell you the exam topic. So if you click on here and open it in, yeah, this is the official uh, content that should be covered for CCNA. So uh, whenever you are going for any Cisco certification training for all of these, you will find uh, their uh, official exam topics like this. Okay, so this is, see, this is not, uh, I made it a certified network associate. So Cisco defines the curriculum that they expect you to know. So you have to understand these things in a thorough and deep way. They, uh, you, you might, I, I'll not go through topic wise topic each of it because it will be too difficult for you to understand right now. But uh, this is kind of like you can download this complete list in the PDF format and uh, have it. Let me open that for you. <laughs> okay, so this is the PDF document. They say that CCNA exam is a 120 minutes exam. And uh, if you're a non-native English speaker, uh, then they give you 30 minutes extra, but it depends on which country you're giving exam from. Like if you're giving exam uh, in like in India, you know, English is not the first language, right? So they give you 30 minutes extra. Uh, even if you have very good English communication skills still. So um, this is a 128 minutes exam. And uh, these are the topics that may be included. And they say that these are general guidelines for content that is likely to be included. However, other related topics may also uh, appear based on the exam To This is just, and uh, the guidelines below may change at any time without notice. So this is uh, the content that they expect you to know. Okay. Uh, I'll, at a lot of places, they will be using the word describe. Describe this, describe that. Whenever they use the word describe or interpret and these things, there, they don't expect you to go and do configuration, but wherever you see configure and verify, configure and verify. So there should be, uh, you know, hands on labs and you should have understanding of this uh, properly. Okay. <clears throat> so uh, we will be uh, going through all of these topics one by one. So uh, this is CCNA. Okay. Now, uh, also, uh, like people have generally question like, okay, how do I schedule an exam? So it's pretty straightforward. It's just like booking a movie ticket. So you click here, uh, schedule exam. They make you go through, uh, you know, the login and all. And uh, you can select a, uh, a basic exam center, which is near to you. Or you can also give the exam online. If you have not given uh, any certification exam, um, of Cisco, I recommend that go to an offline center because there you have somebody, you know, human uh, to talk to if you uh, have any issues, maybe, you know, um, not related to exams, they won't be answering your questions. But like, uh, let's say you have a question where uh, you, you are facing some difficulty because of uh, maybe the electric you know, turning off or the system facing any issue, you have a human being who you can uh, talk to to solve your issues. Okay. Are these also uh, delivered by, by person viewer? I, I didn't get you. Can you repeat? The online exam, it's delivered by person viewer? Yes. Right. Yes, it's the same person view. Uh, uh, delivers this exam so um, okay. you have a webcam open all the time somebody is monitoring you remotely they mm -hmm. yeah so if you have given any certification exam online that that's the same procedure that they uh, follow have, have you given any yes many 
yeah so the then you should be comfortable with even uh, online exam but still i tell people to go for offline because sometimes what happens is you have to use like using a digital scribble board is very uh, irritating <laughs> i personally find it irritating maybe i'm old school mm-hmm. <laughs> okay compared to you know writing it on a piece of paper so if you are uh, or a piece of paper or a erasable pad okay so if you go for the offline exam especially at ccna you know sometimes you have to do subnetting or some uh, little small thing where you have to understand it and you have to draw it so that becomes difficult to draw uh, online like you will be using your mouse to you know do you can't have anything done uh you know at your desk with a paper and pen okay they they don't allow that so anyways uh so to schedule an exam it's pretty straightforward uh, you can click here uh further you can uh you know you can search for the exam they also show you the common ones here so if you click schedule they ask you okay do you want to take it at a test center or online uh wherever you want to do it okay online they tell you that you should have your testing space the room should not should be distraction free private space so the same thing okay uh in a test center you have to take your government approved uh photo id what to expect there are some personal items that are allowed like you know uh glasses and stuff so you can click here and look at what things are allowed okay no calculators or uh, no pieces of paper or anything so uh, you can also read the frequently asked questions here now i'll click next here so it's pretty straightforward you you specify okay what is the preferred language uh, english next you specify do you accept the uh, agreement yes next so you uh, they they give you the admission policy read it okay and uh, they they give you like okay once the exam is passed you have to wait a minimum of 180 days if you who fail an exam you should wait for five calendar days before making another attempt so uh, agree okay and uh, then they give you based on you know the address that you have specified like this is i made it a office uh, office address so like uh, i'm currently in pune pune is a city in maharashtra state in india so uh, here you can see that uh, they they are showing you the required test centers so you can select any of them and uh, go to that okay so like i'm just selecting any of that okay and click next you can also search for more test centers by typing in your address or uh, the zip code pin code something like that so next here uh, you can specify uh, like what uh, date and time so like let's say 25th september is fine for me and let's say 12 hours you can book this appointment they tell you okay this is indian standard time based on which they are telling you the time you can book this appointment so it's pretty straightforward process then you have to pay the price so 300 dollars is the exam fee for ccna the exam length will be 140 minutes and uh, they uh, you know depending upon the local uh, tax rate and all like this the currently you have to pay 354 dollars there's gst here in india which you have to uh, pay so government also takes 54 dollars from your certification exam <laughs> but doesn't give you a certification in return <laughs> so uh, you know you know there should be a certification like this for like okay you paid 54 dollars <laughs> your go- government certified network associate <laughs> so uh, they they try to sell you these uh, extra products which you will not require okay um, like uh, the practice test if you want to practice that uh, also sometimes cisco has some uh, kind of uh, uh, promotional things where they give you two attempts for a little uh, more price so 
you'll have to check cisco.com for that yes you have any question uh this practice test that they give you does it have questions from the real exam no why would cisco do that <laughs> i don't know no Brain no, dumps no. Do definitely that. <laughs> no no the the cisco officially can't do that right so uh, they they don't have that okay so don't don't, don't think that okay i'll be spending 89 dollars they'll be giving me the real questions no um they kind of give you the the type of questions that you can expect but uh, that, like i told you you know you don't require this okay so they are just trying to sell you extra stuff so not required so rest of it you just have to proceed to check out so i'll i don't want to get billed now so i'll just close this uh and uh, i hope you understood how to schedule the exam uh, what are the exam topics yeah any uh, yes. uh, fundamental clarification questions that you have for this uh no okay so uh, they give you these steps okay uh, like review study and train connect to community practice because they have a uh, cisco learning network community where people actively uh, do discussions and all uh, you will not require that but if in case you want to just uh, see what kind of questions people are asking and all so you can uh, do that okay uh, then you practice your lab simulation tools sandboxes you test your you know they they give you uh, i tell people yeah yeah, yeah. this uh, cisco exams they are just theoretical i mean the associate and professional no ccna exam answers. ccna exam uh, there will be uh, true and false kind of questions there will be multiple mm -hmm. choice questions where multiple answers are right where there will be multiple choice questions where single answer is right but then the uh, there, there will be drag and drop which is fancy way of doing match the following questions but the more okay. uh, you can say th these are easy okay these questions i tell people is, are easy the difficult part is where you have to do simulation okay in a simulation they give you a network diagram you click on a router you get cli access of router you have to really perform oh, that's nice yeah okay so that's during so, the exam even the yes. ccna yes uh -huh. so i tell people ccna is tougher than other certification exam because lot of other certification exams they just focus on uh, you know uh, facts are easy to remember you can just cram them up but you know once you get a image where you have pc and this and that and they give you like okay do this do that make sure this has connectivity to that that's where your um, real knowledge and understanding of depth of technology comes into picture mm -hmm. but i think so, it's better because at the end you're supposed to know things <laughs> yes and also i'll tell you um commonly there will be two like the ccna exam will be a thousand point exam and there will be two such questions which will be like uh, around the exact points they will be telling you that day okay but around 200 points or so so they these will be two questions the simulation questions will be heavy so the uh, roughly you have to score 825 or 800 plus something out of the 1000 points okay in the ccna certification exam now see oh, if I you do so simulation you something theoretical it's okay as long as you do the practical yes but see make the point. if you lose the simulation exam question you can kiss your ccna goodbye because <laughs> you lose to 200 points right so yeah. ccna bye bye even if you answer everything you will just be scoring 800 right mm -hmm. which will not lead you to pass so i'm not trying to scare you but uh, make you aware <laughs> that uh, you have to really understand the hands on stuff you can't miss out on this you can miss out on a true false question that will be two points or four points no problem okay because we don't have to score 1000 out of 1000 but simulation question you can't uh, you know lose that okay if you lose that ccna is gone yep understood so let's start with 
the training okay i'll start from very scratch although i'll skim through because i know you have a little bit of networking background so i'll skim through some of the very fundamental things okay we we use network all the time and uh, what is a network you have a fully interconnected group of devices you use it for reading news taking money out of atm uh, booking a cab looking at maps and all now often times when you look at it from an end user point of view as an end user uh, just like you know when you drive a car or maybe a two wheeler uh, you don't look under the hood what all things are happening right you just drive it but uh, if you go to a mechanic they know that under the hood a lot of moving parts are there in the engine in the wheels and you know a lot of other things so networking when people as an end user uh, look at it they think okay what are they doing they are just connecting cables and making it work okay but it's not like that okay it's a lot complicated and you can guess it definitely from here when you know you can see that they have divided it into so many further streams so uh, you can spend almost your whole life going through networking content of just cisco and still you will not be done with it so uh, it it takes a lot of different technologies lot of different uh, things that are involved into networking now uh, most modern networks carry different kinds of traffic they carry voice traffic when people make voice over ip calls they carry video calls traffic they carry text graphic so you have to understand the requirements of all these different types of traffic and really make it work so uh, let's understand what is internet and what is intranet you i'm sure are using internet every day but uh, sometimes you know we don't understand it from a real networking point of view okay so our focus is here on understanding it from a network engineer's point of view and this understanding helps you understand the scale of uh, networking behind the scenes working for your internet so uh, what is internet can you uh explain what what's your level of understanding so that dana yeah. mm, yes um well it's a, a connection of uh, routers which is firewall and servers <laughs> everything connected in between them mm -hmm. uh yeah i mean the end user needs access to some kind of information that's usually on a storage or on a server right but to access that server you need to go through all of the network devices like uh, routers and switches okay great <laughs> so uh, see uh, let's start from very fundamental suppose i have to connect two different pcs okay i can take a cable and connect them up and this will work fine like a machine can be connected with b but quickly you will realize that you can't scale it up you uh, suppose like have to go through uh, and connect a machine c you will need more network cards here to connect a c machine with another b machine right because now you are requiring two network cards at each of these machines so in order to you know doing uh, you know doing this more efficiently what we do is instead of having these machines get connected we take a piece of networking equipment like you mentioned switch right so switch is a network device with a lot of network ports and we connect everything to the switch and we can scale it up based on the number of ports available in the switch and have even more machines connected now this is typically where we say that this is a local area network because a can talk to b b can talk to d and you know all of them can talk to each other but now uh, internet okay how how did internet come about if you go into the history of it initially people were concerned with just connecting a few pieces of equipment then they connected more and more so somewhere where you know you build another lan like this okay let's say i connect more pcs with this 
and I want to connect this LAN to that LAN. That is where you utilize a router and uh, think of router like a, you know, a roundabout or an intersection of road. Okay. It's just a networking road. Okay. And you are having these two LAN now connected. Now, uh, you can connect even more and gradually what happens is this network grows bigger and bigger and bigger. Now, out here on the internet, what is really internet? Internet is a network of networks. So you have a lot of different networks interconnected with each other. And uh, that is how internet gets built. Now, if you go into the uh, fundamentals, there are basically... Uh, consumers, like the building blocks of internet, consumers are people like me and you who are maybe watching a YouTube video, uh, streaming a song or doing something which is hosted by some business. Okay, so maybe uh, there is Google hosting their uh, videos, their content on servers in a data center. And then uh, we are streaming that. But in order to stream that, we take up a connection from a service provider. So the third part is internet service providers. And uh, basically, these are the core uh, parts which make this internet possible. Okay. Now, if you look at the current architecture of internet, what they have is they have tier one ISP. So tier one ISP are very big internet service providers. Okay. Um, like there are only 13 to 14 uh, service providers around the world, which are tier one ISPs. These are massive. Like uh, they have, you know, uh, like, let me show you. So it so will help you in understanding how big internet is is okay so if i go into tier one isp or tier one network if you just search that uh, here you get a list of service providers of tier one networks now you see here there is at and comcast these are company names okay so most of these companies are from us uh, and you, you can see in India, we have uh, the Tata Communications, uh, which is a very big uh, telecommunications company. And you can see the fiber kilometer route. This will tell you the massive scale of their network. Like if you look at at and this is like, you know, this much kilometers of fiber route. And this is very large scale, right? So you can say that if let's say Tata, as a service provider wants to go from one geographic location to another geographic location, they have deployed so much uh, fiber across the world that they can geographically move from one place to another without trying to go through other service providers. Okay. So this is the only list of tier one networks. Uh, and now what they do is there is one tier one ISP and there is another tier one ISP. All these tier one ISPs, they also need to be interconnected. Okay, now why they need to be interconnected? Because let's say um, I am in India and I take a connection from Tata. Okay, and somebody is in US, they take a connection from at and if these two tier one ISPs are not connected with each other, my friend in US will not be able to talk to me, right? Like they, we can't send traffic to each other. So these service providers are connected to each other and they form kind of the backbone of the network of internet. Yes. You have any question? Uh, no. No. Okay. Fine. So. Then you have tier two ISPs, which are smaller. And what they do is they generally get connected to multiple tier one ISPs uh, because they want 
and i'm just drawing one line it doesn't mean one fiber cable there will be you know lots of redundancy here so i don't i don't want to you know create a mess here of wires but each of this uh, cloud like thing that you uh, see me drawing here it contains a lot of routers it contains a lot of their locations because any service provider will have a lot of geographical locations lot of offices lots of fiber connecting all these things up and even uh, if you look at the service providers like tier 1 tier 2 isps they have cables going through even the oceans okay if you uh, search for submarine cable map you will look at this one and here you can see that the massive scale of uh, internet like you can see lot the each of these is a fiber cable going through the ocean connecting all these uh, things on the internet okay because between continents we have large oceans right so if you if you look at you know let's say if you click on one of these okay i'm just randomly clicking on one of these so you see this cable it's uh, 21700 kilometers in length it goes from here here these are the landing points so this tells you the massive scale of uh, internet okay and this doesn't include this is just submarine cable uh, the cables through ocean uh, it doesn't include the cables that we have through the um, you know land so we have really built a very big uh, lot of wires a lot of connectivity and all that okay so when you say internet this picture lets you visualize like you know internet is something really physical we are taking a lot of uh, things and connecting them up okay and uh, like i was uh, reading one of the articles news articles like one of the uh, landing points Uh, in mumbai tata had a, a fiber cable connection okay and uh, the speed for that was uh, 3.4 uh, terabytes per second okay that one <laughs> landing point of fiber connection okay so so very <laughs> massive scale right and obviously that was not meant for one person <laughs> it's meant for a lot of people okay but you get the point like how this internet is built up now uh, if you look at this image this tells you that we have a lot of tier 1 networks connected with each other and then we have tier 2 isp which are smaller maybe you no know, country wide and uh, they get connected to multiple tier 1 networks and uh, then there is tier 3 which are single home isps which are uh, within you know one uh, autonomous system i'll i'll come to what is autonomous system don't worry about autonomous system right now but they they are having a little regional presence not even sometimes country wide so then you have businesses consumers all the internet users so suppose i have to build a data center somewhere i'll try to get connections from multiple service providers to my data center and then host a lot of racks and equipment in my data center which people will be coming through service providers and accessing now this is internet i hope uh, you got a little bit of better clarity into it okay and uh, because we'll be needing this information to understand a lot of other things later then you have uh, intranet okay intranet is uh, the um, network of a company yes if you go back to the previous yes. slide the ixp what did i do see there are multiple kind of uh, pairing connections that you form like suppose uh, think of it like this okay um now google has lots of data centers okay so uh, sometimes what they'll do is they'll have pairing 
uh, with service providers the benefit of that pairing will be like whenever people access uh, google data centers they'll be able to fast reach that uh, reach the google services okay and uh, sometimes even uh, this has happened to me where uh, when when i try to access google services okay like my other part of internet connection was down i'm talking about home use um even today morning okay while uh, uh, surfing internet i i checked internet connectivity was not there but all the google related services were working like you know youtube gmail uh, and a lot of other google services okay so that is generally because uh, these very big businesses they establish pairing connections uh, with the uh, service providers uh, and th this helps them in uh, getting better connectivity for the end user because a lot of times uh, see lots of bandwidth will be utilized to go to youtube right everybody is streaming and all that so it's also better experience for the customer of the isp okay so there are various other terms uh, we don't need to get into that because this is like the beginning okay i don't want to get into too much technical uh, stuff right now okay because uh, if i go into this uh, of routing through pairing and all so it will be you know going more into highly technical stuff too early <laughs> okay okay you can read this if you are interested and if you uh, understand a little bit but uh, that's not required okay the main aim is to make you understand that the scale of internet here okay mm -hmm. so then you have intranet okay intranet is internal network of a company that is what we refer to as intranet like suppose we have multiple branches and we have these branches uh, connected with each other obviously through a service provider but then uh, when a person is within the network of the company we say we use the word they are in the intranet okay uh, within the network okay so uh, just to be clear because you know sometimes people think okay this is maybe a typo people wanted to write internet so we want to clarify intranet now what is networking networking is construction design and use of network including the physical cabling hub bridge switch router you use a lot of devices and then you do selection and use of different protocols okay we'll be going into what is a protocol protocol is basically rules for communication okay and uh, you use computer software to manage the network you use uh, computer software to monitor the network what is the uh, working like and you also define operational policies and procedures related to the network okay now uh, there are like it's not just about you know plugging in the cable and making it work okay you have to uh, do a lot of other things like uh, you know configuring these uh, devices with different protocols to make it work now what are the different devices we have on network uh, you understand desktop computer laptop uh, do i need to explain like what is a switch you have seen it right oh yes okay so switch is like i even showed you we can uh, connect multiple computers on it it contains a lot of ports you can build a small local area network on it then there is routers which uh, are used to connect two different networks and uh, have communication between them i'm not finishing off what is switch what is router right now but the aim is just to give you a little high level overview about these devices because we will be utilizing these terms uh, to explain concepts then you have servers which are uh similar like computers it's just that there is a little bit more cpu more ram more storage 
on all the resources part. And uh, then there we have something called an IP phone. Uh, because a lot of times we already have a very big, uh, good quality network setup of computer networks. So instead of uh, having the landline phones, the traditional uh, phones, what we do is we can plug in a cable from IP phone to switch. And these IP phones have just like uh, your desktop computer, uh, they, they require the regular network cable, uh, which is having an RJ45 connector. So similar RJ45 connector is available here. Commonly for LAN media, you use a straight line to show the cable. For wireless signals in diagram, you use something like this. Although I'll not be drawing it like this. I'll be drawing it uh, mostly like this if I have to connect uh, to maybe Wi-Fi router. Okay. So uh, then you have WAN. Wherever we want to show you having connectivity to wide area network like internet and all. Commonly, the uh, the cable is shown like this to signify that this is a WAN connection. This is not a local area and a connection. Okay. Uh, then uh, there are some parts of network where we don't want to get into the details of it. Okay. Cloud doesn't really mean the cloud computing service providers okay like uh, cloud providers like aws and all no uh, cloud in network diagrams in most cases will mean the part of the network where you don't want to get into the details of it like suppose i'm drawing that okay i have to uh, connect one office maybe in uh, let's say pune india and i want to uh, connect this to somewhere in the new york Okay, then we'll say, okay, we'll take a connection from service provider here and service provider here. Now, why we are drawing this cloud here is because we don't want to get involved into the details of this thing, like how uh, this is connected to that. Because obviously there'll be a lot of routers, a lot of devices making things work uh, from here to here. Then you have wireless routers, which uh, are Wi-Fi devices. Uh, the smaller versions of it, you use it at your home. For larger versions and more enterprise networking, we have different devices. We'll be talking about wireless devices a lot uh, later in this training. We'll be spending uh, a good number of hours on that. Okay. Now, uh, lastly, we have firewall which is basically a security appliance. So just like you buy a switch, you buy a router, you buy a box of firewall, a hardware firewall. Let me show you. If I search for Cisco switch, <clears throat> typically this is what a switch looks like. Okay. A device with lots of port. If you look at router, there are these routers. So it contains fewer ports and you use it to uh, connect different network uh, devices. Okay. Then further you have appliances, hardware boxes for firewall. Okay. So you buy these boxes and you use it to give security, like let's say we want to get connected to internet, we don't want to allow attackers to get uh, into our network. We utilize a firewall at the edge of the network. And uh, like, suppose this is our office. Commonly, the connection will be terminated at a firewall here. Okay. And then it will be allowed to come in so that we can decide who who is allowed to come in and what they are allowed to do. Okay. So this is kind of the introduction of the different networking devices that we have. So next, let's talk about what are the expectations uh, from a network. Okay. Uh, we have two major expectations from a network. One is fault tolerance. 
uh, fault tolerance as the name suggests like you know we want to have redundancy okay redundancy of everything where like you can see in this diagram here uh, what we are having is we are having two connections okay rather than having one connection from the service provider uh, like in a typical office network you will have two internet connections and if possible you will put them on two different routers the benefit of it will be that let's say something happens to this router or this connection uh, from sometimes from two different service providers like maybe service provider a and service provider b different service providers you're having connection so uh, that you have fault tolerance if something happens to this uh, you are still able to go out on internet and come back so uh, fault tolerance that network should limit the impact of hardware or software failure and should recover quickly whenever there is a failure okay now it's not just about redundancy of the connections okay a lot of times you also have to have redundancy of sometimes power you know the electricity so rather mm -hmm. than having um, you know uh, plug in everything to one power strip one big power strip you are plugging in everything to it now uh, the routers are fine but the power strip fails so <laughs> you have to take in account each and everything it uh, should have redundancy of everything so that is one expectation from the uh, end users the second expectation is that the network should have scalability means uh, basically the future uh, you know future expansion and future addition of uh, things should be a, a, uh, should be easily doable with the existing infrastructure uh, let me give an example okay uh, suppose we have 20 employees in our organization okay and when you have 20 employees let's say uh, your friend makes an organization has 20 employees comes to you uh, says okay uh, you know suggest me a networking switch and you give them uh, give that guy a 24 port switch now if you give the 24 port switch to that person already on the switch they are having 20 employee devices connected maybe one device one port is already going to internet a router and all now they are left with just three ports for future use so not so good right because uh, the day uh, he or she hires a few more people uh, there will be problem right you will have to have uh, to buy a new switch Rather than that, you should have thought about scalability and uh, gave uh, a switch which had more ports, maybe a 48 port switch, okay, so that they don't have to immediately rush and uh, you can always solve any scalability problem by throwing money at it, okay, you can spend more money and you know get things done, but you can't do that very immediately in any business decision. In any company, when you have to make a purchase decision, that doesn't get done overnight. You get quotations from multiple places and then do it. So uh, you you should make sure, like if you see in this diagram, we see that there is uh, extra ports available on these routers so that we can, maybe we started with this thing, okay? We started with just this, this part, okay? But then uh, we have in future use case available things, ports available uh, for adding these routers and all, okay? So you should need to, you should think about scalability, okay? Network should be able to expand quickly to support new users or application without impacting service to existing users. Now next, let's talk about components of a communication. Any communication, there will be a identified source of message. Let's say you have an image which you want to get delivered to this laptop. So you will be converting this data into bits form and then sending it out through the network card uh, through actually a medium a medium meaning maybe a cable uh, on wireless we have electromagnetic waves and currently i'm not assuming any networking device in between this server and that laptop so just one cable connecting the server directly to pc whatever bits you send on the cable uh, receiver receives it 
decodes it, converts it from bits into uh, the data back. Okay. So what are the things that we learned? We learned that there should be a message source, there should be a message destination, there has to be some kind of medium, and uh, these uh, this data needs to be converted into bits and then sent on to the medium. Then the bits need to be converted back into the data. Okay. So uh, now further, if you look at it, uh, here we have different kinds of network. Okay. See this same image that I'm showing you, we will be going into the details of uh, this more and more. Slowly we'll be adding routers uh, and we'll be adding uh, further devices in between to understand a lot of things. The same explanation will get deeper and deeper and deeper as we progress through the training. So uh, we have different kinds of network. Okay, You might be a little aware of these uh, words that we build a local area network, which is uh, for sending communication within an organization or within a room or within uh, a company premises. And then you have wide area network, then you have campus area network, metropolitan area network, Soho, small office, home office network. Commonly, you have to understand these two terms very importantly, the term of LAN and the term of WAN. Because once you understand these two terms, you can easily uh, understand those other different types of network because they are kind of like a bigger version or a smaller version of something. Okay. So let's understand local area network this term first okay um can, can you explain what's your current level of understanding what do you mean by local area network well usually like uh, in an office building if you have uh, um yeah i was thinking like the accounting department for example has their own plan but it's actually a private plan right <laughs> um i don't know what i have at home it's a LAN because it has a private ip and then this IP is going to be translated to the one. Okay. Yeah, I don't know if I explained right. But yeah. <laughs> okay. So see, uh, the way people define local area network is that LAN is a network over small geographic area, okay? That you build a network over small geographic area and that is uh, where LAN comes into picture. But if you took this word, okay, small, what do you mean by small? Okay, because a small word in itself is very relative, like you can say my house is small or my house is big <laughs> compared to maybe a chair, right? So yeah, probably uh, if you compare a small city from India with Switzerland. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Could be as so, big as Switzerland. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so the thing is that <clears throat> you have to understand where a land begins, where a land ends. Okay, because you might have one uh, room and you connect devices in that room and say this is a local area network okay and then you have maybe a building with lots of floors and you connect everything up and then still it is a local area network so how do you define local area network we define local area network that a network which is designed for small geographic area but where does it end yeah, this depends on the subnetting, right? Yes, it depends a little on the subnetting, but also on uh, the requirement. Like, think of it like this, okay? Suppose I have to connect this building office with another building, and these are geographically distant, okay? Far away from each other. Mm -hmm. Now, one way of doing it is that, okay, I will go, and lay down a cable from this building to that building. Okay, but let's say this is 100 kilometers. It will be stupid to <laughs> just go and deploy this fiber cable or whatever cable we are using, right? So what we do is, this is where you go and take a connection from a service provider. 
you take a connection from this service provider uh, here, one service provider, another service provider here. And this is where your van starts. Okay, van basically starts where you start taking services of a service provider. Okay. So the small is relative. You might be having one very big building or even two buildings and uh, have it still in the local area network. Okay. I hope it is clear that where local area network ends. Okay. <clears throat> now, you could have a, a department of an organization. You could uh, also have uh, another wide area network now. Now, what do we mean by wide area network? See, this is a network which provides transmission of data between geographically distant locations because we don't want to get involved into the hassle of going through uh, implementing cables, laying down cables to have connectivity between geographically distant locations. So we start taking services of a service provider and that service provider has already done the hard work of implementing these cables even through oceans we saw that and uh, we can utilize those uh, pre-existing network to have connectivity uh, between our offices so one of the examples of ideal network is internet now further you see we have campus area network now all of these other words that you see these are somewhere uh, based on LAN and WAN definition because when you say campus area network what you're saying effectively is that you are having a maybe office campus or a university campus and you are having lots of buildings uh, within that uh, university or office and then you are connecting them up. Now still in order to connect these buildings you can see we are not utilizing some services of a service provider. We are laying down the cable and making it work up and running within our office campus. So in a way you can say campus area network is a bigger version of LAN because still you are not taking services of a service provider. The main aim is to provide connectivity to users, employees, students, maybe in a campus, okay? So, like I told you, you know, now this small geographic area has become a little bigger, right? Uh, when you have campus area network. Then uh, there is another term called metropolitan area network. Now, see, this term of LAN and WAN also depends on from where you are looking at it. Okay, what I mean by that is, suppose this is your home and you take a internet connection from a service provider. Okay, now, till now we were focused on this part. Okay, let's ignore this part. Now let's understand how is this service provider built the network. Okay, so we'll zoom into this a little bit. Now, in order to build this service provider network, a lot of times they have to, like I'll, I'm giving an example uh, of one of the service providers here, which I noticed from the outside. I don't work for that service provider, but you know, being a uh, knowledgeable network engineer, you understand, okay, what is this device doing there and that. So based on that, I could guess what and how they built their network. Now, what they have done is, um, it's a small service provider here uh, around our office. Okay. So what I saw was that um, th there is a big residential building and within that residential building, that service provider has put up a switch. Okay. Uh, either in the parking or at the rooftop somewhere, you know, where most people don't uh, go. Okay. And uh, whenever somebody within this building wants uh, an internet connection they will basically go and get a cable to their house from this switch okay and scale out their network now when they do this basically i'm now talking about how this cloud is made up so suppose you are living in this building 
you are getting your connection from a switch of a service provider. Now, whatever is WAN from your point of view as a customer is LAN for the service provider network engineer, right? And then they have these multiple uh, switches which are in each and every building connected through fiber cable. And then they also have it connected to their office with other service providers, okay? Now, I don't want to create a mess here, but you get the point that when they have these links and these buildings connected, now this is not their office premises what they are connecting on, right? This is not their office campus. This is public space which they are using to connect it and uh, make it work. And this is what we call a metropolitan area network from a service provider point of view. So it's a network uh, which covers sometimes entire city or sometimes parts of city using land technology. And we call it a metropolitan area network. It's again a, a slightly even bigger version of LAN. Okay, a local ISP network uh, is a good example of metropolitan area network. I hope it makes uh, some sense to you. So further, uh, we have Soho type of network, which is small office, home office network, which you use at your home, uh, like. Uh, Let's say in my home, I have a router switch and I connect all the uh, devices to switch. Sometimes this functionality may be provided in one single device. So you might not have to buy two devices. A uh, lot of these uh, devices have combined functionality. These days, most cases, people use Wi-Fi. So uh, one device might include a functionality of a wireless access point, a router and a switch all in one device, okay? So this is not built for a large number of users. This is built for home use or small office use, a small business use. And just to be uh, clear on like what kind of devices I'm talking about, like uh, let's go for window shopping, okay? On Amazon. Suppose I search for a Wi-Fi router. And uh, if you look at any of these routers, okay, you see there is a this color connection where there is a small internet written at the bottom. Okay, so here this one is what you can use to connect to internet and these four ports are you can say what is an inbuilt switch onto this device there similarly might be other devices having a similar kind of solution so you can see that this uh, port is being used for van then you have four ports for okay so this is uh, what i was talking here now then we have another term to understand uh, which sometimes we use is a data center. So a data center, what is a data center? A data center is a very, very big building with lots of servers, lot of equipment, racks and racks of equipment. And uh, you're building it to host uh, massive quantities of data, massive quantities of uh, things which people will be accessing. Okay, so like... Uh, let me show you. They even uh, the Google data centers, they have put a gallery on their website. Okay, so if you want to see people really working, although these people more feel uh, like you know posing things <laughs> so uh, feel, feel like models <laughs> posing for certain situations like okay can you please click a photo of me but uh, mm. this is really a google engineer neil so he uses special equipment to raise all of the data on old servers so you have a lot of different locations a um, lot of different uh, you can see 
This is Patrick doing a visual inspection of water pipes running through floor of Douglas County Georgia data center. So you can see lots of uh, equipment are there. Okay. So if you see from outside, okay, you can uh, see the category places. Okay. You can see that these are massive buildings with uh, lots of uh, redundancy of power, redundancy of connectivity. And uh, th these are high resolution images. So if you feel like you, know, you may be putting one up for a wallpaper, you can download it. <laughs> okay. They are available to be downloaded in high resolution. Okay. <clears throat> I, I like some of the tech side of things, like you know, really nice image. <laughs> okay, so uh, you, you can see crashed hard drives. Yeah, they're very artistic as well. Yeah, this is really artistic. So <laughs> put this kind of thing, you know, it's like shooting a bullet through a hard drive. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I would so, put on my desktop for inspiration. Yeah. So, some of these are really like, I, I think one or two people are just there for, you know, clicking at these artists. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I see how clean the cabling is. Yes. <clears throat> so you can see even like insulated pipes. So <laughs> everything looks very artistic here. And uh, anyways, uh, so you get the point, like what is a data center? Like, Whatever you see in these images like this, this is what it looks like to a network engineer. So you have lots of servers, lots of storage, and then you connect them up on a switch, uh, then aggregate it with routers, connect them up with service providers and all. So what is a data center? The aim is to just give you an idea uh, so that you have a better understanding. Because a lot of times uh, when beginners come, uh, I'm not talking about you, but uh, a lot of times beginners I've seen when I ask them, uh, is internet something physical? Uh, can we touch some parts of it? Uh, they're like, no, it's uh, everything is virtual. You cannot see it. Okay. So you know, this uh, data center and these terms make them understand, okay, you know, when you access something, it doesn't come from here. So <laughs> it it has to be hosted somewhere. So it's a facility used to house computer systems and associated components and includes lots of redundancy of everything. Okay. Uh, connections, security devices, everything. Mm -hmm. Now, any communication, you need rules like, okay. And there are different expectations. Like when you are here, you know, uh, you talk and greet in a certain way when you are with uh, defense people, army people, uh, you talk and greet in a different way. And whereas when you're talking to baby, you will not talk about like, okay, what do you think about Russia, Ukraine war? You know, <laughs> so <laughs> there are different uh, uh, ways, you know, you communicate and different ways you um, have rules for communication. Okay. So like even in our conversation here, we have a rule that, you know, we'll use some common language to communicate. Okay. I'll not use some local language which you don't understand you will not use some local language which i don't understand but if we do that then there's no communication so this is what we call a protocol so what is a protocol it's a rule for communication now you might say okay what are the different types of rules that you have you have to have a sender and receiver you have to have a method of communication like here we are meeting online right you have to use common language grammar speed also matters if i talk to uh, fast, you might not understand it. If I talk too slowly, then you might get distracted. So speed, timing, and also, you know, uh, time to time, you are giving me confirmation by unmuting and uh, saying like, okay, I get it and all that. So there should be some form of acknowledgement as well. So now that you understand what is a protocol, there are two types of protocol uh, majorly if we divide it into a uh, categories. There is proprietary protocols and then there is standard protocols. Now these proprietary protocols are those protocols which we use uh, and build by a particular vendor. Like let's say Cisco uh, spends a lot of money and gives it to their R&D team. They create a protocol 
which uh, Cisco only owns the rights to use. So that is what we call a proprietary protocol. Uh, companies do this to gain technical advantages um, and sell more equipment because you know if they are uh, creating something uh, breakthrough, they they get to sell more devices. So that is why people uh, do this proprietary protocol creation. So the other part is you create a standard protocol. Like uh, I'll give an example. Uh, when you connect your mobile to your home Wi-Fi, you know you don't while selecting your home Wi-Fi or you, while selecting your mobile, you don't check compatibility. You assume that it will be compatible, right? Because Wi-Fi is a standard-based technology. It is not a proprietary owned. Uh, technology by a particular vendor so you might go for any home wi-fi vendor and maybe a samsung mobile or maybe an apple mobile or any of other vendors that you like and it will still work if both of them have wi-fi so we want protocols to be more and more standardized because that helps you in having inter vendor operability because um, you can have your equipment of uh, multiple vendors. And initially when they started doing networking, they built proprietary protocols for everything. At that time, IBM was a very big company. Uh, I'm not saying it's a small company right now, but IBM was a uh, company like, you know, these days you uh, treat Google or, you know, um, Amazon, these kind of companies, you know, you treat them like, okay, you know, these are massive companies. So that, that kind of company was IBM at that time. They, so they were developing computers and all that. So mm -hmm. when they developed uh, uh, computers, they also developed networking gear. And uh, because everything was proprietary, so if you were uh, buying anything from IBM, um, you were kind of locked into that thing. So uh, people didn't like that because that way you had to have everything from one vendor in which you may not like, okay? You like, just like uh, you may be buying an iPhone, okay? But you may not like the MacBook, okay? So uh, you you may like a Windows laptop or a Linux laptop and uh, maybe use iPhone, okay? So just like you don't like to buy everything or you may like a LG fridge, uh, LG refrigerator and... Uh, you may like a Samsung TV. So uh, we want to have standard things, okay? For standard things, there are organizations like IEEE, Institute of Electronics and Electric, uh, Electrical and Electronics Engineers, uh, who have developed the standard of 802.11, which we call uh, commonly as Wi-Fi, okay? And then there is IETF, Internet Engineering Task Force. This is another non-profit organization. Uh, who works in the uh, for the benefit of all the vendors who work for the benefit of humanity you can say in a way and uh, make protocols which are standard based like you know you use ip tcp http ftp you don't care about the vendors which vendor server is it which vendor uh, client is it which browser is it these are standard based protocols okay now uh, one benefit of doing CCNA is you learn a lot of standard protocols. Like in CCNA, you can say around 70% uh, of the stuff, 70% of the protocols that we will be talking about here will be standard based. So once you have the knowledge of them, you can apply that to Juniper, Fortinet, Palo Alto, whatever vendor you work on. Okay. And that helps because uh, that is more useful knowledge. The more uh, standard-based protocols knowledge you gain, it is more useful knowledge because proprietary technologies and proprietary protocols have to go away. Okay, uh, they they will be parallelly there, but uh, sometimes some vendor fails in certain equipments, and uh, people switch over to another vendor. The standard-based uh, knowledge that you have gained. Uh, doesn't get lost. Okay. Yeah. Any question? No. I'm just looking okay. forward okay. to learn more. Okay. So what IETF does is they 
keep their standard protocol in the format of RFC. Okay. Now, what do I mean by RFC is, let me show you. Now, see, I don't want you to go and read RFC today. Okay. I'm just showing you because in some documentation, in some books, somewhere, sometimes you will see um, RFC number written. Okay, mm -hmm. let's say somebody talks about IP and then in the bracket you will see RFC 791. So what is RFC? Basically, this is the research paper uh, which defines the things. When you say like, okay, IP address is 32 bits, where is it written? It is written in the IETF documentation. Okay, the document number RFC 791. Okay, and uh, my aim mm -hmm. here is just to make you understand what do these numbers mean, okay? Uh, the aim is not to make you go and read this, okay? Because you, you will read it probably when you are, um, you know, more uh, pro into networking, okay? Uh, beginners should definitely not read it. It's just that making you understand. Uh, yes, a lot of times when, uh, you know, professionals have their, uh, you can say, disagreements with each other like let's say i'm talking to somebody i say okay no ip address is 32 bits and he says no it's not 32 bits so you know you can refer this is the ultimate uh you can say constitution of network engineers okay from where they can refer you can say and see this is written here so anyways you can see internet protocol uh this is darpa uh, defense advanced research project agency which is uh, a u.s uh, government agency and they create uh, new technologies. Their aim in creating this internet was not to have people do Facebook and WhatsApp and all these things. Their aim was pure military, as you can see, Defense Advanced Research Project Agency. So what they did was they created something called Internet Protocol, okay, and Internet Protocol uh, Program Specification. And this was in September 1981. So we are not learning something very brand new, right? It's very old, <laughs> almost more than 40 years old technology that we are still using. So that's also one benefit of, uh, you know, things in networking. They are quite stable. Uh, some of these things will remain rock solid for many, many years. So if you look at this, uh, this was prepared for DARPA and it was prepared by information Sciences Institute, University of Southern California. Anyways, let's scroll down and they include everything like introduction, motivation. Why did we create it? Okay, if you look at this, uh, what's the aim of Internet Protocol? The Internet Protocol is designed for use in interconnected system of packet some switched computer communication network. So uh, you use this to switch packets. Such a system has been called CatNet. In this documentation, they have called it a CatNet. And the internet protocol provides for transmitting blocks of data. So you chop the data into blocks of data and uh, transmit them called, uh, they, you call them datagrams and you transmit them from source to destination. Now, as you can see, this documentation doesn't look like, uh, you know, a normal book. It's more or less for uh, somebody who understands things already. Okay. It's kind of like a research paper language that they have put this thing in. Okay, so the main aim here was to make you understand that what is really the, uh, when, when you see these numbers written at a lot of places, let's say you're reading a Wikipedia article or a book or anything, this means that uh, according to this standard, okay, just like in, um, you know, in constitutions, let's say you say, okay, uh, stealing something is bad according to constitution you get whatever uh, punishment for that so uh, you might say okay where is it written it's written in section this article this that so it's kind of like that what we are referring to here in request for comments now when you communicate okay uh, to make things easier for you to understand let's take a uh, example here what we do is we take the data and uh, think of it like we take data and we chop it up into smaller chunks and then pack it. Okay. Now, uh, this example works 
for most people to understand why we are using multiple protocols because even when you are talking about communication between two devices uh, let's say a simple web page being loaded from this web server onto this web client for that also there is multiple protocols being used so suppose you have data you don't send all the content at once okay um, think of it like this suppose i have a very big book which i want to send to you and i maybe divide this book into parts into sections and send each section of the book separately so similar kind of thing happens with the data you take the data you chop it up into smaller chunks take one particular part okay let's say this part and pack it up in a box okay there is no real box but this is just so that you can easily understand now on the box you add something called a header okay what is a header a header is extra information okay what do we uh, put there okay like suppose on the data side okay suppose we take the book example when i'll be sending you the book that very very big massive book which i give you in um, parts what i will do is i will uh, put section numbers on it like okay this is section 1 that i am sending this is section 2 that i am setting so this extra information this is not the book okay i am putting a label here on the box so that you can easily rearrange this book once you get all the pieces of it right so this is what's the job of a header the job of a header is to take all that content okay uh, this is the real data okay this is what we really wanted to transfer but we are adding this label so that it performs certain function like in this case the function is to provide you rearrangement and so that you can order this in the proper uh, order right this is what we call labels that you add further think of it like we are putting this box into another box and now we are putting a new label onto it this label contains the address bar okay and this tells from where this uh, chunk of data has come and from uh, to where this chunk of data is going all right similarly you pack this up into another box and then uh, do a similar thing now i'll not get involved into what this label is doing but you see that what you are doing is you are using uh, the same uh, you can say setup here just like the book and having things being packed and putting labels on it just like you know when you order something online these days uh, there is a extra label there is a box that the thing comes in okay suppose we order this wifi router from amazon or wherever we get this box we get this label and everything and this is what helps us in safeguarding the contents of the box but once you receive the thing you throw the box away uh, the label is just meant to make the thing reach till you right similar way here when we want to transmit the data we have multiple different protocols involved suppose i want to send this image first thing first we will not be sending this all at once we will be chopping it up into smaller parts and then we will be taking this one section of it putting some headers then putting another protocol like http is the hypertext transfer protocol which you use for web browsing then there is tcp you pack it up into ip header then you pack that up into another header so you see 
within the device, let's say I am having two devices here, A and B, I am taking all that data and making it go through layer by layer through these multiple protocols and finally converting it into from the form of bits and sending it onto this medium. Okay. So this is the aim is to just tell you that there are multiple protocols even in one single communication. Mm -hmm. oh, this is very interesting. Uh, and yeah. so you have the data that's the payload. And then the first header after the data, it's always the application header? Yes. Okay. Yeah, I'll go into, I'm not, I'm not going into application transport and their names. We'll get into that. Okay. Mm -hmm. But yes. uh, it's very good for awareness. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So um, the aim is to explain to you that it's kind of like a layer by layer thing that is happening here. Mm -hmm. The aim is to explain to you that you should understand that these things work in part. These protocols are working together to make this thing possible. And this is what we call encapsulation. What is encapsulation? Think of it like taking this chunk of data, this small chunk of data and packing it up in a box. Okay. There's no real box, but just for the sake of visualization, okay, easy of understanding. And you put a label on it. That is what we call encapsulation. So what is encapsulation technically? It is the process of adding extra information because this extra information, this label is not that actual thing that you packed in the box. At the end, the sender and receiver care about this real data. You know, they don't care about... Um, these labels, these labels are just meant to perform certain things uh, in a certain way while the data is on the move. Okay. So this is the process of adding extra information around data on a particular layer in the form of header and trailer. Okay. Like trailer gets added uh, at this level. Okay. Here we add a trailer. I'll come into what's the job of trailer and all later. Uh, so this is what we call encapsulation. And then at the receiving side, just like we went and we packed it up like this, we do uh, this thing in the reverse order at the receiver, right? We go and uh, take this frame header, decapsulate and get this out. In a way, think of it like, you know, unpacking this box, taking this box out, unpacking this box, taking this box out and then taking uh, the actual chunk of data out. So uh, you can say in the decapsulation process, it's going like this. Okay. In the encapsulation process, it's going like this. Layer by layer. So decapsulation, if you look at it, it is the process of removing this extra information because the job of this extra information was just to make sure that data reaches uh, the device okay so uh, we remove this header and trailer from data on a particular unit and that is what we term as decapsulation so this encapsulation decapsulation process happens all the time just like we were talking about that server thing if you take that same example now now in order to send this image you can't send it all at once you'll be chopping it up into parts and then all the data that gets chopped up, you'll take one piece of that, you put it here, you put a header around it. Then you take this and put it, uh, put a new header around it. Then you take this whole thing and put a new header and trailer around it and then transmit it in the form of bits. Okay. So the server is one by one putting these headers. All this is happening within the device. Okay, this is not happening at the network level. And finally, once it makes all this, it will transmit this in the form of bits out onto the medium. Now, this is at the sending end. And currently, we are just focusing on this device uh, 
um, you know, these two devices connected with each other directly. We are not concerned with what is router doing, what is switch doing, nothing like that. Okay. Slowly we'll get more and more deeper into it. Now at the receiving end, what happens? You receive the bits. Okay. Once you receive the bits, you take the frame header, you take the uh, content of that out, you take it out further and then slowly you try to gather all of this data. So what is encapsulation? It is the process of adding control information. So basically adding the header as it passes down through the layered model, just like you saw. Here it is happening in the opposite direction. You are removing this control information as it passes upwards through the layered model. So you are in a way, once you receive the bits, you are removing each of these headers one by one and then displaying the data. Okay. Any questions in this? No. Okay. Now, uh, do you understand binary maths? Oh, you'll have to explain it to me again. Yeah. You, you understand it is as easy as one, two, three. Right? <laughs> you <mean zero> right? One. <laughs> and I hope you understand binary maths like this guy, not like this guy. Okay. This is also binary maths that our ancestors used to do in caves. <laughs> so fine, you understand this. I'll skip over this. Uh, you understand that there is decimal which is base 10, has 10 digits, binary, which has base 2, 2 yes. digits, hexadecimal has 16 digits. Clear on hexadecimal as well? Yes, but I forgot how to do the calculation, so you have to show me. Okay, no problem. So uh, you understand that there is 1, 2, 4, 8, 16. Yeah, okay, right. For binary, right? Mm hmm so how do you do conversion? Okay, let's get involved into that. <clears throat> Basically, any numbering system like base 10 has 10 digits. So you do 10 raised to the power 0, 10 raised to the power yeah. 1, 10 raised to the power mm -hmm. 2, 3, and 4. Okay. And then similarly, because this has just two digits, so 2 raised to the power 0, 2 raised to the power 1, 2 raised to the power 2, 3, 4, Similarly, hexadecimal is 16, so 16 to the power of 0, 16 to the power of 1, the power of 2, 3, 4, likewise. And all of these go till infinity. That's how any number system is made. Now, um, you have to get good at binary to decimal and decimal to binary conversion because this is what we require for IP addressing and subnetting. Do you understand IP addressing subnetting? Like, have you have you tried it? I understand the concept, but I don't know how to calculate it. Actually, okay. I knew and then I forgot because I didn't use it. <laughs> okay, fine. So, uh, see, it's uh, we we will go into IP addressing and subnetting later, but. This is uh, the make sure that you are familiar with binary to decimal and decimal to binary conversion mm -hmm. because uh, that helps you in understanding uh, all of this in a better way. If, if you don't understand binary to decimal conversion, there's no way that you can be good at subnetting. So suppose we have a number of decimal of 45. Now, how do you write 45? You have to look for the biggest number that you can subtract out of 45. You can't subtract 64. You can't subtract 128. You can subtract 32. So you turn on this bit. Okay. Mm -hmm. So 45. Uh -huh. Then I I remember now. you okay. subtract 32 out of it. So it remains as 13, right? So mm -hmm. since it is 13, you can see 16. 16 can't be subtracted, but 8 can be subtracted out of that, right? Mm -hmm. So you can turn on this bit. Then you have 5 remaining. So 4 can be subtracted out of it. Then you have just 1 remaining. So 1 bit is turned on. Rest of the bits you can turn on 
uh, turn them off okay you can also write mm -hmm. this zero zero it, it doesn't actually have any impact just like you know if i give you a a thousand dollar check or if i give you zero 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 thousand dollar check it's one and the same amount right so the leading zeros here also don't mean anything although the banks will be suspicious if i give you this check you know they'll be like what <laughs> what this seems some forged forgery or some kind of thing done <laughs> so um, here similarly you can do it also in the opposite way okay you can try adding it some people don't like the subtraction part uh, so suppose 59 i can't turn on 64 uh, but if i turn on 32 and 16 32 plus 16 that is 48 so it's still lesser than 59 so you you can also go it in the reverse direction instead of subtracting it you can try to keep mm -hmm. adding it 32 plus 16 that is 48 and 48 and 8 that will be 56 okay so now we are doing it like this so then 56 you can't turn on this bit because if you turn on 4 56 plus 4 that will be 60 we don't want to go till 60 so we'll keep it like this but we can turn on this and this so 2 plus 1 3 3 plus 56 mm -hmm. that will be 59 okay okay yeah now uh, in order to practice this i want you to play a game okay so you can just go and search for cisco binary game for now till we start <clears throat> the IP addressing subnetting, spend 10-15 minutes playing this game. So if you search for Cisco binary game, you will reach here. They say in order to pass CCNA, you need to be proficient at converting decimal to binary. So play binary game. Here you have some instructions. Okay, uh, I'll be sharing this link. I'll post this in the chat. You can copy it from there. So here, uh, they are giving you the instructions and you can see that there are two types of puzzles come in two flavors there is binary puzzles where uh, there is a number written and uh, like four is written here and you have to turn on the bits toggle the bits on and off and equal to the uh, four and then there is decimal puzzles where you have it in binary you have to write it in decimal on the right side okay mm -hmm. uh, so Let's play the game. So suppose we have five, okay? Now, if I have to make five, I have to turn on this bit, right? Four plus one, five, right? Mm -hmm. So if I turn on this, it is eight plus one, nine, right? It doesn't get solved. So if I turn on this one, four plus one, five, the line is gone. For two, I have to turn on this bit, but four plus two makes it six. So you can't do it like this. So you have to turn it off. So this is uh, the way it is and then two plus one uh, that is you click on here you specify three hit enter it wipes so then this is what 16 one six enter. so try playing this game okay uh, so that you are more familiar with quickly converting binary to decimal and decimal to binary uh, conversion okay uh, the the level gets increased like you are currently at level one slowly uh, they will increase the uh, speed at which the questions are coming and then slowly uh, this will be gone okay like 128 64 32 so you have to remember it so mm -hmm. uh, try to make a good high score let me know what's your score <laughs> okay okay so play for around 5-10 minutes, 20 minutes daily. Mm -hmm. Play some music for relaxing while playing. Earlier they they used to have very bad, you know, weird, uh, very, uh, you know, earlier that Nintendo kind of games used to have that very monotonous sound. <laughs> so the, that kind of music was there with lots of to, no, no, something like sound. So they removed it, thank God in the newer version so play some music 
Uh, you can also uh, try doing this uh, decimal to binary conversion questions from subnetting workbook like I was telling you here. We will be needing this later. Now, um, further, uh, you know, if you look at, you understand decimal, you understand binary, there is hexadecimal. Hexadecimal goes from 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, then A, B, C, D, E, F. Okay. So there are 16 digits in here. And uh, one hex digit basically takes up four bits. Okay. If you have to write F, uh, you have to write again 1, 1, 1, 1. Why? Because this represents 1, this represents 2, this represents 4, and this represents 8. So 8 plus 4 plus 2 plus 1, that is how F or the 15 number gets created. Okay. So the point is that in order to write one hex digit, you need four bits, right? So to represent a digit in hex, it takes four bits. And uh, if you have 64 written in decimal, it is not same as 64 in hex. You might say, why? Because, see, suppose I have to write 64 in decimal. I can write it like this. This represents 1, this represents 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, 64, and 128. The same thing. Okay. So you just turn on the 64 bit and leave everything else at off if you want to write 64 in decimal. But if you have to write 64 in hexadecimal, this is 6. And this is 4. So here it is 1, 2, 4, and 8. Similarly, here it is 1, 2, 4, and 8. So in order to write 6, you have to turn on 4 and 2. That is what you see here. In order to write 4, you have to turn on just this bit okay so just to be clear 64 in decimal is not same as 64 in hex so you know these are two different things next we have to start with osi tcp ip model uh, first tell me like uh, till now everything clear any doubts yes no it's everything clear I like to generally start with OSI TCP IP model on a fresh day. Okay. But let's just discuss a few things here and then we will end for the day. We'll uh, not go too deep into it today. We'll start with it uh, tomorrow in the fresh class. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, let me give you a little bit of history uh, of where TCP IP comes from, where OSI comes from. See. Initially, when uh, U.S. Department of Defense, that DARPA agency that I was telling you, this U.S. Department of Defense, when they started creating this TCP IP model, they just went ahead and uh, created it for military purposes. Okay, Their aim was not to join people and make it uh, work for um, you know, Facebook and all these uh, social media platforms and different things that people do. Okay. And like I told you that earlier, everything was proprietary. So there are two organizations. One is International Standardization Organization. They went ahead and developed OSI model. And U.S. Department of Defense developed something called a TCP IP model. And there were many more, like there was De DECnet, Apple was developing something called Apple Talk. Um, but now currently we don't talk about that because we don't use that. We use just TCP IP. So there were many other uh, rival models which were being used uh, at that time. Okay. Ultimately, 
TCP IP one, and uh, that is what we currently use. But see, let me be clear here. This OSI model made by ISO is a reference model. Now, what do I mean by that? This means that we have to, uh, th this is not really an implementation. This is not what we actively use. Um, like US Department of Defense, when they made TCP IP model, TCP IP model is an actual implementation which we use day in, day out when you use internet, even right now when we are having this online class, that is happening because of TCP IP model. Okay. So here, internet uses TCP IP. OSI is just a reference model. What do I mean by reference model? Let me clarify with an example. Suppose we are standardizing car. Now in a reference model, we will say that in any car, there will be an engine. Okay, there'll be wheels, there'll be a body of the car, there'll be seats and all. But we are not actually talking about any car because we are just saying standard. These are the things that should be in a car. Similar way, when you say OSI model, it says, okay, if you are doing networking, there should be some form of address to identify the source, to identify the destination. But what address, uh, what is the size of it? They don't get into that. Just like in a car's reference model, will not get into diesel engine or petrol engine. Okay, will not get into how many wheels, four wheels, maybe six wheels, we are making some supercar. Okay, what kind of body will it be? Uh, how many seats will be there? Two, four, five, seven. Okay, so the point is when you talk about an actual implementation, let's say, you know, um, you go and take a, a Toyota, some model, okay, let's say, Toyota Corolla, okay. Then you are talking about a particular engine that, okay, it will be diesel engine or it will be four wheels. Uh, there'll be this type of body. There'll be five seats and all, okay. So that is the difference between TCP IP model and OSI model. OSI model is a reference model. It's a one size fit all model. You can even judge it from this thing that if we go into a Windows machine, and open control panel, network internet, network connections. Ignore this part, okay? These are some of the virtualization related stuff that is in my laptop. But you can see that in my laptop, I have different network cards. This is for Wi-Fi through which I'm currently connected. These two are physical RJ45 ports with which I can plug in a cable and make it work. And then there is Bluetooth. Okay, so my point is like if I uh, go into this right click properties and let's say I go into IPv4 here, you can see here it is written as what TCP IP and even IPv6 TCP IPv6. So we are currently using what we are currently using TCP IP oh, model TCP in implementation. OSI, you will not see anywhere written. Okay. Okay. Now, in OSI model, there is seven layers. 